digging into DHCP. Now, you might ask yourself, well, Keith, didn't we already cover DHCP in a previous nugget? And we did, but there's a separate element on the blueprint for the Network Plus from CompTIA, and I wanted to share with you an inside scoop on how we really implement the technology. So we're going to take a look at a reminder about how DHCP operates, and then we'll take it one step further to walk you through specifically how it's implemented in a corporate network today. I'm excited about this video. Let's jump in. So let's take a closer look at the world of DHCP and remember some of the content that we've already discussed and maybe reinforce some of it as well. If we have a brand new PC on a network, the fastest way to get that up and functioning is to be a DHCP client. So for DHCP to operate, that's the dynamic host configuration protocol. We've discussed it previously. There's two parts to it. There's a client and a server. For a PC to be a client, when it boots up, it says, oh, I'm supposed to obtain an IP address automatically. I'm a DHCP client. It issues a DHCP discover packet. So we have a discover that goes out from the client. A, so that goes out. A server responds with an offer back to the client. The client says, I'll take it. That's a request. And then the server sends a final acknowledgement saying, okay, great. I understand you got it. And do you remember the acronym? It's Dora, like in Dora the Explorer, which doesn't even rhyme no matter where you're from. Actually, maybe depending on where you're from, it rhymes. But that's a great way to remember the four packets involved with a DHCP exchange. So how do we tell our client that we want it to be a DHCP client? We simply click the checkbox in the network configuration of the PC that says that we'd like it to be a client. So to reinforce the concept of how we would set up static or dynamic addresses, let's bring in our PC. So this is our PC from right here. And let's go ahead and configure the network connections and network interface properties and go down to IP. And we'll simply click on properties. Now currently it's a DHCP client. So if it says obtain an IP address automatically, that is dynamic addressing. The PC pops up. In fact, we could take this PC put it on any different network segment where there's a DHCP server that's listening and it would automatically try to get an IP address. It would be given an IP address appropriate for the subnet and away it would go. So let's go ahead and statically configure an address. That's this option right here and verify how that works as well. So it's really a good idea to belong to the street that you live on. Now, Keith, what do you mean belong to the street you live on? What are you talking about? Well, take a look at this right here. Let's say that all the other computers, including the router on this network, believe that the network is 10.1.0.0 slash 24, meaning that the first three octets are the network of 10.1.0. If we're going to configure a stack address on this PC, we need to do two things. Number one, we need to make sure that the first three octets are 10.1.0. That's the street. If we are on a different street on the same layer two broadcast domain here, we're not going to be able to talk to anybody, including our default gateway. So secondly, we'd also need to take an IP address, a host address that's unique. So let's take uh, 99. I don't think that's in use. So we'll simply configure that on the interface right here. So we'll say 10.1.0.99. The mask is 255, 255, 255, 0. And the default gateway is going to be 10.1.0.1. That's the IP address of this interface of the router. And for DNS, we can use 8.8.8.8. .8 .8. That's a public DNS server from, I believe, Google. So once that's done, we just click on OK. If we can reach it, I need to make my window a little bigger so I can reach that. So there we go. So there's the OK button. And once we close that, now our IP address has changed to that. Now, how do we verify that? Start, command prompt, and then on XP anyway, we'll do an IP config. And that verifies what our IP address is. And also to verify we have connectivity, we can try to ping to 10.1.0.1. If that works, hooray, woohoo, life is good. Okay, so that is a static address. A dynamic address would be using DHCP. And just for fun, to reinforce the concepts, let's capture the traffic between the PC and the network. So we'll capture it while we do DHCP. So I'm gonna, in the background, I just turned on capturing right here on this portion of our network between the PC and the router who's acting as a DHCP server. Go back to Network Connections, and we'll right-click, go to Properties, go to IP, 
They get an IP address automatically, including DNS, automatically. Click OK, click OK, and we can verify that with a packet tracer here in a moment. But from the command prompt, we'll do IP config, and look at that. Nothing. We've got nothing. So perhaps it's not done yet. Let's IP config again, and there we go. So it just took a few moments for the DHCP to complete. Now it's four packets. It does happen super fast. It could have just been that Windows XP took a few moments after I clicked apply to actually do the DHCP process. So I've got the IP address. Let's take a look at the packet capture just to see the play-by-play -play between this PC acting as a DHCP client and the router acting as a DHCP server. So let's bring in the protocol analyzer and look at the play-by-play -play between this PC acting as a DHCP client who's asking for an IP address and the router who's acting as a DHCP server. So the client issues a DHCP request and remember our acronym for this, it's DORA, that's the four packets involved, discover, offer, request, and acknowledge. So the client sends out a discover packet. If we take a look at the contents, at layer five, or the application layer, it's a request to for um, DHCP, and DHCP is encapsulated at layer four into UDP. It's being sent to the well-known port of 67, because that's the listening port for a DHCP server. The UDP is being encapsulated into IP. The IP is being chopped up into the appropriate frames for the network, for the Ethernet network. The destination layer two address is a broadcast because the PC doesn't know exactly where our DHCP server is. So everybody in this broadcast domain is gonna get this frame, whether they like it or not, because switches forward broadcast to all other ports in that same broadcast domain, in that same VLAN. So everybody gets the content. So everybody decodes it, looks at it layer three, and at layer three, it's still a broadcast. If you look at the layer three address. So everybody's still interested. And then when they all look at layer four and say, oh, I'm not listening on port 67, the printer throws the rest away, the PC throws the rest away, but the DHCP server, the router says, oh yeah, I'm listening on port 67 because I'm a DHCP server and it replies. So if we close all this back up again, here's the reply, the offer from the DHCP server, the router acting as the DHCP server. So it makes an offer and the offer it says this, hey buddy, I got something for you. I have a beautiful IP address and I think you're going to like it. It's 10.1.0.53. If you'd like this IP address, says the DHCP server, you let me know. Well, what does a you know conscientious client do? It says, heck yes, I'll take it. And it sends the request. So the request then is sent back to the DHCP server saying, you know that IP address you offered? I'll take it. I'd like it. Thank you very much. And then we have a final acknowledgement that comes from the DHCP server, the router in this case, back to the client. And in the acknowledgement, if we look at the application layer information, it includes the IP address. Just to confirm, I understand, says the DHCP server, that you are going to use this beautiful IP address, but you can't have it forever. What? What do you mean you can't have it forever? Well, the reason we don't want to hand it out forever is because it might, maybe we have somebody who shows up on the network for one day, and then they leave. They're an out-of-towner, and they leave. Well, if they take their laptop with them, it would be a shame to allocate an IP address to that user, and then after they've left, never be able to use it again. So we're going to use a lease, and leases are temporary. So included with this acknowledgement are some additional information, including it has the identification of the DHCP server. So the router is saying, I'm the DHCP server at 10.1.0.1. It's specifying the lease time, which is one day. So that basically after one day, it, unless you have other arrangements with me, your lease for this IP address is over and you shouldn't use it. But instead of waiting a full day, let's go ahead and have you renew that in 12 hours. So it's all yours for a full 24 hours, but you come back to me in half that time, 12 hours, and renew it, and then I'll renew it for another day, unless my configuration has changed on the DHCP server. It also has some other internal details, including the mask that's associated with the IP address and the default gateway. So all of these options that are being handed out, things like the 
the DNS server for name resolution, the default gateway to get off the local network, the least time and so forth, all those are considered options that are being handed out. If this was an IP telephone, there might be some options that are being handed out to that telephone during DHCP that would indicate where a server is that that telephone can go ahead and download a file from to get its initial configuration to kind of you know get the information it needs to be a really good IP telephone on a network. So let's just make sure we're comfortable with the pieces that we've covered so far. Number one, we can configure static addresses on a PC and that's no big deal, easy to do. We need to make sure we get it right and we'd also want to configure things like default gateway, the DNS server, and it takes a lot of time. Instead of doing it all statically, we can use DHCP and set up a DHCP server and do it dynamically. And not only can we make it very easy to configure IP addresses, we can also hand out the other information such as the DNS servers, the default gateways, domain, domain names and so forth that we can hand out very, very easily. A scope is nothing more than a set of IP addresses or pools of IP addresses. Now, for example, let me go ahead and move this just a little bit out of the way. As our protocol analyzer, we're done with that PC for a moment. And let's talk about uh, just the concept of scopes. A scope is a fun way of saying a range of IP addresses. What? A range of IP addresses? What do you mean? Well, let's consider this network right here. This network, because we created it that way, is the network 10.1.0.0 slash 24. So it's the 10.10 network. And over here, let's say we have the 10.2.0.0 slash 24 network. Now, if we have DHCP clients here, and we also have one here, I'll make a new client there, we're going to need to have two scopes or two pools of addresses to hand out from our DHCP server. That's all it means. So when you see a scope in the concept of DHCP, you might just want to consider that, oh, that means a pool of addresses. So if there's two subnets that you need to hand out IP addresses to, a DHCP server would have two scopes, one appropriate for each of the subnets. The leases are simply handing out IP addresses for a short period of time. Usually the default is one day, but you can make them longer or shorter based on the configuration of the DHCP server. And the options would be the items such as, what is your default gateway? If you want to get off the local subnet once you have an IP address, what is your DNS server? If you want to resolve names like google.com to an IP address and options such as, what is the actual DHCP server that gave you this IP address? So those are all considered options inside of DHCP. Now, the other part right here, a reservation, I'd like to talk about for a minute. What is a reservation and why would we use one? Well, let's say that we have a printer right here and we want that printer to be the address 10.1.0.say 65. That's the address we want to have that printer use. Now, we could manually configure that IP address on that printer and we would be done. Another option, however, would be to train this printer to be a DHCP client, D-L-I-E-N-T. He could be a DHCP client and we could simply train the DHCP server, listen, hey, Mr. DHCP server, when you get a request from the MAC address, the specific layer two address of this printer, I want you to say, wait, you're special, and I have a special IP address I'm going to hand out to you exactly. So instead of getting a random IP address on the subnet, you can hand out the exact IP address you want to that specific device. And that's what a reservation is all about, a DHCP reservation. So let's do our checklist of the pieces. Static, where we hard code an IP address on a device and dynamic using DHCP. Reservations where we tell the DHCP server to hang on to a specific IP address and wait for that right person to show up based on their MAC address. Scope is a pool of addresses and a lease is how long we're going to offer that IP address to that client for. And the options are things like the default gateway and DNS and other things that that client might need to fully participate and enjoy the IP network. So here's the piece that often is alluding to somebody who studies DHCP 
and then they go to a production environment and they're lost on far, as far as how it works. I want to put the pieces together from the concepts to the real implementation. And let's do this. Let's have a router here and another router and yet another router. And let's have some small networks. It's also a good idea to see a network represented several different ways because not all the topologies are going to look the same. Let's we'll say over here we have the 5.1.1.0 slash 24 network. And over here we have the 6.1.1.0 slash 24 network. And over here is the 7.1.1.0 slash 24 network. So three separate networks. And of course, that's a network and that's a network because every interface on a router, every layer three interface is a different network connection. Again, the routers are the glue, like the intersections between all the streets or the networks. So if we wanted to do DHCP for all of these, here's what we could do. We could have a network down here, and we'll make one more, B8.1.1.0. We could have a server right here. I'll put an S on its chest for da 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 I'm super server. But what we're going to do is we're going to load some software to make it a DHCP server. And we don't have to load too much software because uh, Microsoft servers and Linux servers and other devices have the ability in software to be a DHCP server. So on this DHCP server, what we would do to support these three networks is we would create three scopes. Remember, a scope is something like, or it's just another name for a pool of addresses. So maybe we say scope number one is going to be the 5.1.1.0 network. Scope number two is a 6.1.1.0 network. And scope number three is the 7.1.1.0 network. Okay, we're off to the races. Now, we also might want to do some, some restrictions and tell DHCP, oh, you know what? Um, inside of each of those scopes, don't hand out the IP addresses of dot one through dot five. Because maybe our routers are dot one on those subnets. And maybe we have a printer or something else. So we can actually tell the DHCP server not to hand out specific IP addresses in that subnet, but feel free to hand out the rest. So we set up our individual scopes. We set up the actual options for those scopes, like the default gateway. So the default gateway for scope one, we could configure as dot one. And for scope two, it could also be dot one. That's right here. So this dot one refers to that default gateway. This dot one refers to that default gateway. And dot one here refers to this guy. So as far as the options go, the default gateway is our most critical. And probably the second most important uh, option to hand out would be the DNS information, the server they go to to resolve names to IP addresses, which we've covered in a previous lesson. So now we've got a DHCP server right here. It's got three scopes and three pools of addresses. It's all ready to go. But here's the problem. A broadcast, because that's what a client does. This client comes up. It does a, it's configured to use DHCP. It does a broadcast, and where's the broadcast go? Well, the broadcast is a layer two broadcast. It goes to all other devices in that local area network, in that same VLAN, in that same layer two broadcast domain. So the broadcast this guy sends out at layer two is never going to reach the server. And that's a huge problem. And But this is how we configure in a corporate network. So you might say, okay, Keith, this PC is doing a broadcast. It's asking for an IP address via DHCP. The server's way down here in a different broadcast domain, a different subnet. How does it work? And the answer is da 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 da, IP helper. <laughs> IP helper is a feature that we enable right here on this interface of the router. And it basically goes like this. You and I are going to have a conversation with this router. We're going to say, dear Mr. Router, can we talk to you? We know that you're a router, and we know that you have knowledge of how to reach all kinds of networks based on your routing table. What we'd like you to do is if you hear a DHCP discover packet where a client's sending out a layer two broadcast, and inside that broadcast at layer three, it's, it's sent to the, the layer three broadcast as well. And as you de-encapsulate it at layer four, if you see that as a DHCP request, to the well-known port for DHCP, do me a favor, and we want you to forward that packet over to the DHCP server. And that's what IP Helper does. 
It takes a DHCP discover packet and it forwards it as a unicast packet over to the server. So that server could be five routers away, five hops away. It could be completely remote even from the local network because the router is taking the DHCP request and forwarding it via unicast to the DHCP server. Now once it comes in, the router is going to indicate where it came from. It's going to indicate the source interface where it saw that. So when the DHCP server says, oh, it's a DHCP request and the source of this network where it's coming from is the 511 network because route, this router is tied to that network and that's where he heard it. So he looks at his scopes and says, I've got one, two, three. Do I have any scopes appropriate for the 511 network? It looks at this one, says, yes, I do. And you know what it does? It makes an offer. So the offer is sent back to the router and then the router forwards the offer back to the client. And so from the client's perspective, the client doesn't really know that it's not all happening just locally because the, the discover, the offer, the request, the acknowledgement all happen just as they normally would. It's just that this router right here is doing a proxy. It's, it's, it's going as the, the go-between guy between this client trying to get an IP address and this DHCP server that's remote. So where would we use IP helper? We'd use it on this interface and this interface and this interface of the routers and we would tell all three routers that the DHCP server was at 8.1.1. Let's say it's 50. And that's how it's actually implemented. So the DHCP discover is a local process, but the IP helper function forwards that to a centralized DHCP server. Now, how does that make it easier for us? It's a lot easier. Check this out. It's a lot easier to manage one DHCP server with three pools than trying to manage each individual router with each of their respective pools. So centralized management for the assignment of IP addresses. So I've had a lot of fun discussing and going a little bit deeper inside of DHCP with you. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.